Hey, welcome back to my car shop. Today we're going to be continuing work on the fender for John 66 Belvedere. Let's watch the show intro. I'll meet you in 30 seconds on the other side. We'll get into this. Working out of a 100 year old refurbished barn, bringing 35 years of experience to projects considered beyond repair. Vision, creativity, and problem solving are the essential tools in this place. Watch as we transform junk into polished metal miracles. This is My Cars Shop. All right, so in our last episode, we spent time putting the patches on the fender, uh, bottom corner, front, and then up on the top. So in this episode, we have to uh, fix the bottom corner of this splash shield, get this put back in there. Uh, we'll probably just rush condition that, not sure. We've got the holes across the top here, and then we need to uh, strip the paint off the fender. So that's going to be what's happening today. I uh, want to get this fender back in primer. My air compressor bit the dust since uh, I was last out here. And so uh, I'm not gonna be able to shoot anything with a spray gun today. It was 20 degrees out here this morning when I came out. It's only about 30 now, and we got a little ways to go to heat the shop up yet, but I wanna get moving on this and get this done today. So uh, let's rock on with it. All right, I thought I'd take it down here and show you about what I'm doing. Um, so I'm fill welding these holes that are here. And I'll show you the process that I do uh, when I do that, is I will take, pardon me while I get my gun, I will take my, uh, my MIG welder tip and I'll get the wire started on the opposite side of the hole. And I'm just um, pulling the trigger, just bzz, 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 bzz. And what I'm doing, over on this side of the hole is I'm building up the material so that I can come across and fill that up. So I'll do a little bit and I'll show you what it looks like once I get started. Okay, so you can see now I've got some well over here on this side. I wish I could just put the camera behind the lens and let you see what I'm doing, but um, I don't have that ability right now. So anyway, I've got this filled up here. Now I'll let it cool a little bit and I'll be able to come back in there now and run a bead on that and just fill that hole right in and they get that done so let's uh let's get that done here All right, I tried to do full disclosure, so you know, not hiding anything here. Um, metal was pretty thin up in here. I, I kind of suspected that it was, and so I ended up chasing a couple of holes for a while there, but uh, got it all done up now. So what I've done is I've made a little coin here that is going to uh, go up from the back side, and I'll, uh, I, there's several ways I could do this, but I think for the simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna hold this with my hand up underneath, and then tack it in place and I can weld that in there. This hole's a little big to fill well. Um, this was just a whole bunch of little pin holes here. So that's why I didn't bother making a piece of metal for that. But I uh, need a bigger piece here. So I'll just put this piece of 18 gauge behind it. It's heavier than it needs to be, but quite frankly, it won't burn through. So it'll give me a good piece on the back side uh, to go in there and fill that and weld it. So let's get that done.
worked out exactly as I hoped. The 18 gauge was heavy enough, I could just pour the raspberries to it. Uh, because it is on a peak here, I'm not worried about warping so much. Um, I'll tap this down just a little bit in here, but uh, there's so many compound curves right in here, this is pretty strong. But I did go ahead and pour the raspberries to it and build up a little bead there so that I don't have to make this fender top piece uh, out, of, out of fiberglass. I can just shape that out of the metal now. So uh, all the holes are now filled, I believe, and um, we're ready to move forward and do some metal shaping here with the grinder. So we're just gonna get it roughed in a little bit here with the uh, disc grinder. So here's what we got after it's metal finished. Now we'll go ahead and put a little primer on the back side back there. There's a few little whoops in there. Some of those are from what I did. Some of them are from before. But overall, it looks good. By the time you put a uh, little coat of tiger hair in the spots where the welds were, uh, not much at all. And I probably won't even need any Bondo. We'll just use polyester primer and block that out. And uh, it's gonna come nice. That edge is gonna crisp up really good. And uh, it's gonna look outstanding once it's done up. So one of the challenges, I normally go over this with my DA, but I don't have any air right now. So uh, I went ahead and used a fiber disc on the uh, six inch grinder and it turned out pretty good with that, so. So my next thing here is to get this corner of this inner fender well fixed it's uh, rotted off I could try to take that bolt out of there it's just going to tear so I'm just going to cut this off weld a new piece on the corner drill a new hole and that'll be able to attach to the to the fender where it belongs uh, just saving time get that out of there it's rotted anyway I don't see any point so we'll just tag on a new corner real quick and be done with it Okay, so I've got the piece cut and uh, rounded the edge off. I haven't drilled a hole in it because I want to drill the hole actively uh, where it goes through up here um, for the bolt. So I'm just uh, getting ready to tag this on here. Just a tiny little bit of overlap, not much. That's good. Get one more pair of clips uh, of uh, vice grips, clamp it down here, and then we'll be able to go ahead and weld this on there. Okay, so uh, we're getting there. It's looking good. The edge is off a little bit here, but that's fine. I really want to make sure that I have enough material down here to drill so that that bolt will go through there. Um, so we'll get this welded in place here, and then hopefully we'll have enough strength. I may go ahead and weld it on both sides. Uh, we'll see what it's like once I get it. I probably will. Uh, but we'll run a bead on here and then go from there.
not the prettiest, but we had a little rust in there, and I did it in like four or five different spot welds, but for what it is, it's fine. I'm not going to metal finish that or anything, because who cares? It's underneath the fender, so i uh, just got to get it fit over there once it cools down and get it in place. Then we can drill the hole through it. I think it's going to fit in there good. Uh, it's got to be bent here like this. You can see that here. Um, this angle goes down here where this hole is, and so this has got to got to kind of kick in like this and be bent a little bit up in there but it's close so uh, we'll just get that tweaked and we should be golden i was test fitting it to see how it was going to go and it fell into place so easily it was frightening so i want to take this cage nut out uh, and then just clamp it here and drill a hole through it but everything else is lining up good there's three bolts in here you can see this one here lines up that one there lines up, that one there lines up close enough, so everything's going to be good. So we'll just pull the cage nut off up there, and then drill a hole through so that we can put the bolt in there, and done. You know, people will say, well, how in the world do you know how to make this stuff? Um, it becomes intuitive. You know, I do a lot of measuring, obviously. Um, I've been doing this stuff for 40 years, and... Uh, Matter of fact, I was thinking we need to update the show intro. But anyway, I've um, been doing this for 40 years, and you just get a feel for how things need to be. And on a lot of stuff like this, I don't really need to measure it to the nth degree to, to get things to fit properly. Um, so... Um, again, center punch is important. keeps the drill from walking. So for those that don't know that, spend 10 bucks, invest in one of the invest in one of these snap punches. Another thing I recommend to these four tool, um, throw them in the glove box of your car. That way, if you ever end up underwater in your car and you can't get out, push that against your side glass, snap, snap, it'll shatter the window and you'll, it'll save your life. Um, these are 10 bucks. They're worth it. Put one in every car you got. Trust me, it's worth it. I'm also drilling this hole oversized that gives room for adjustment so the hole that I just drilled here right now is about the same size as the bolt or what it would be for the bolt but I'm gonna go one size bigger just so that we have plenty of room in there Started putting it in there and realized I had, <coughs> excuse me, had rust conditioned it. So that's rust conditioned now. Let it dry for a second, then we'll bolt it back into the fender. So the next thing I want to do now is strip the rest of this paint off of here and um, I've gone back and forth on how I want to do this but I think the best way to do this at this point is just to chemical strip it. Um, I could use my big grinder uh, but it's a little hard on the metal where I use that big grinder on the roof of the Challenger because there's so much rust and tree pitch and stuff on there. Um, this paint is coming out pretty easy. I could use one of the purple discs, uh, but it puts a lot of heat into the metal, and so I think what I want to do is, I'll try a small area here, but we'll go ahead and chemical strip a spot and uh, see if it works as well as I think it's going to and make a final decision. Uh, I can't use my DA, because once again, the electric motor and my compressor bit the dust, so I'm dead in the water with that. Uh, but it would take too long to DA this off anyway, so. Uh, I think we'll just try, we'll try a, a spot here and see how it goes. So I watched the small spot here in the back for a little bit and I could see it starting to bubble a little bit knowing that I'm so used to old school strippers that would have 
this has been on here for five minutes now and it already would have been bubbling and ready to scrape off. Um, but everything is so dumbed down in today's world. Um, so this is supposed to take half hour, 45 minutes. So uh, I think we're just going to let it sit here and soak and I'll go get some lunch and then we'll go from there. Hopefully when I come back out, uh, we've got some good bubbling and we can scrape all of this off. That made pretty short work of it. Got a lot of it off of there. So I'll go over that with a uh, 10 inch grinder uh, with a fairly decently um, mild pad. I mean, not 40 grit, but maybe like 80 grit, just lightly. And then go over it with the purple wheel on the six inch grinder. And uh, we'll see what we get when that's all stripped down here. But uh, I think we're close. Uh, the bulk of the work is done and uh, it can be a lot easier to just get this down to shiny metal here now. So occasionally there's comments made about why I don't keep the 47 Ford covered up and uh, it's because I'm not worried about rattle can overspray and stuff like that. That car's so far away from where I'm working, nothing's gonna get on that paint. However, I'm gonna be, de or not DAing, but I'm gonna be grinding this down now where there was this stripper and I am concerned about that getting splashed on the car. So uh, I cover it up as soon as I'm done with this, that cover's going off and going in the washing machine. Um, I'd much rather have that visible where I can see what's going on if something gets on the car. Um, I dust it off every day, I pay close attention to it. So it may seem like I'm being negligent with the car, but I'm actually not. I've actually had issues in the past where something got on a car cover, soaked through and ate into the paint. And so in the shop, unless I'm doing something that I'm really concerned about, like painting a car, I'll cover it with plastic. Uh, otherwise, I keep the car uncovered. It's actually safer, in my opinion, for the car not to be covered up so that I can keep a closer eye on it. And I go over it with the California duster every day and blow it off and make sure that you know nothing is on there that's an issue. So uh, I also did the same thing with the Oakland, although I don't have a car cover for that. I've covered it up with cardboard so that if there's any splash over uh, onto anything there, it's all covered up. So I do gotta pull that car, car cover down a little bit in the back end there on the 47 covered up fender. Um, but I just wanted to make that side note here. I do get some crap sometimes for not covering cars, but there's a reason for it. And that is because in the past, car covered cars have gotten damaged because I, I didn't notice something got on the car cover and soaked through. Um, so I pay close attention every day, like I said, check that car over a while, make sure nothing's on it. And it's always fine. I've never had an issue in years of doing it that way, whether it's the 47 or the 68 or any other car.
couple things I want to touch base on. Not everybody's going to agree with the way I do this. I don't care. This is the way I do it. So uh, I'm lazy. I'm lazier than you can imagine. And having worked in hot rod shops and body shops, uh, time is of the essence. So while I did go ahead and chemical strip this, I don't always do that. As you noticed when I was stripping the roof of the Challenger, uh, if you go back to episode one, two, three, four, or five, or something like that in, on the Challenger series, I use 36 grit discs on that roof because there's just so much heavy rust. There's no other way to get it off of there. Uh, I know there are better tools out there for doing it. Eastwood has a rotary flapper thing that really does a good job, and I know it does, but I'm not spending the money on that. Uh, so anyway, but I went ahead and chemical stripped this because I'm trying to keep as much heat out of the metal as I can And this paint comes off so easy that I didn't feel it was necessary to go after it with 36 uh, I tried a little spot with 36 and it was just too aggressive. It was marring up the metal So I used an 80 grit disc on this, but you'll also notice that the disc that I'm using Is bigger than my, my hard rubber back. So that really gives the edge of this thing opportunity to flex around so it doesn't dig in um, so I, that's the way I like to do it in situations like this. I chemical strip it, I went over it with the, uh, with that disc, and then I went over it with the purple wheel. And I didn't bring that here, but let me grab that and I'll show you what that is. Well, I did have to change the disc in the middle of it. This one's been going around the shop for a while, and you can see it's pretty cl clogged up. Um, it was getting hard to use. There's still use for that, but not for this. So I switched meal of wheels about halfway through, but what they are, I don't remember where I got these online somewhere, but they're these little strip discs that kind of self-clean. Uh, I could have stripped it with that, um, but I have done parts like this before with these discs, and I feel they put too much heat into the metal, which is why I went with the chemical stripping to start. Um, get the bulk of it off of there, go over it real quick with that 80 grit just lightly. Uh, try not to score up the metal too much. Don't grind in on things. I also, I'll show you my technique here in just a second. So when I'm working this, uh, I'm very careful to um, work in without digging too much into there. I try to, with my rotation, I'll try to go up over the body lines like this, down like this, so that I'm not grinding those body lines off. In the flatter areas, of course, I'm just working it. And I do the same thing with the purple wheel. Uh, you don't want to grind on your body lines. I actually made that mistake up here in one spot. I got a little spot where I flattened out a little on top of that fender. I built it back with weld while I was doing the other, so it's no big deal. Uh, but still, you want to be careful of that. So all my body lines are still good. I got a couple dents and stuff I got to fix in here. Uh, the other thing, I may not always look like I'm wearing hearing protection, but I am. Sometimes I just use shop towels in my ears because I get tired of having the headphones on. So. Uh, Always wear your hearing protection and your safety gear, dust masks, uh, stuff like that. So let's get you over to the fender here now and let you see what we got and we'll talk about the next steps. So the fender's cleaned up nice, but I actually had a standstill now. I've made more progress today than I expected, but I need my DA and I don't have an air compressor that works. So my job tomorrow is to get the motor off the compressor and get it taken in and get it fixed so I can get my compressor back. Then we will go over this with uh, probably 80 grit on the DA. And then maybe, that's probably as far as we're gonna go. But the metal looks really good. It's not scratched up, it's just small surface scratches. Um, I'm really pleased with the way this is turning out. I got a little more cleanup to do here, but uh, there's a lot of little dents I'm gonna have to work on. But I wanna get this in primer as soon as possible so that uh, it doesn't rust, but it won't be today. So I wanted you to see where we're at. A lot of dust on here yet, of course, stuff that needs to be cleaned up, but uh, just a lot of little piddly stuff now. But this thing is pretty close. We'll uh, get it DA'd down, and then the next steps, oh, that's the other thing. These purple wheels will also leave uh, some of themselves behind, so you go over that with a DA. It's not on in the metal, it's on the metal. It's just part of the purple wheel that just kind of melted into the metal there. So there's marks all over from that that need to be taken off, and the DA will take that off. We've also got a crease up in here. I can't get at that from the back side. I wish I had a weld on puller to be able to silver slap that out or slap that out, but um, I don't really want to drill, so I gotta ponder what I'm gonna do there. I'm not sure. I can't heat, I'm sure I can't uh, heat that and pull it out with heat. Um, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do there, but I'll find some way to pop that up out of there. Obviously, we have a dent here that we got to pull. That's got to be taken care of. 
Again, we've got a bubble here, a couple dents here. But this fender, I mean, considering this is a 1966, uh, this thing is in amazing shape. So with the patches that we welded on, if you didn't see the last episode, we put the front of the fender on. And we put that bottom corner of the fender on down there. And then there's one piece up on top I'm not going to bother showing you. So, and of course, you saw what we did today. So, yeah, there's another little dent right here. Sometimes you can see that uh, because of the, the disc didn't grind down in there. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of little stuff in there. But uh, DA it down, hit it with etch prime, and then we will go over it with a fill prime and uh, block it out. And that's probably where we will leave it until we get it on the car. And we have to do some color matching and blending and so forth. And I think we'll need to uh, do our finish prime and our... Uh, blocking and color obviously on the car so we can match it and blend it into the door. Well I was hoping to get some Bondo spread on there today but uh, the more I thought about it trying to rush around and get the compressor fixed today was not really a wise idea so I'm gonna leave this here so we'll probably do one more episode if you guys want of doing the finish work on this fender. Um, I know that there's a bunch of finish work on the 47 series somewhere in the middle of that, probably in the 20s of that 30-some series uh, on that car, where I'm, I'm doing the final sanding and priming and blocking and painting of those fenders. But I'm not sure I've done things from bare metal up on the channel yet. So this will be a fun little project for an episode that I think will make its own and will take some time and show you how I do the tiger hair and the bondo and the priming and all of that stuff. So we'll leave that as a third episode or fourth or whatever it is in this series on John 66. Um, so yeah, that's what's coming next. So hopefully tomorrow we get that fixed on uh, the compressor and get ourselves back in the air here. I'll be able to DA all this down. It's going to look really nice when all those scratches come out of there. And uh, it's not, they're, they're not deep scratches at all, but you want a little friction uh, in there anyway. You like a little bite in the metal so that the product you're putting down bites in. That's what I believe. I've worked in a lot of hot rod shops, restoration shops, body shops over the years. And uh, the reason I do things the way I do is because time is money. So I'm not going to sit there and take time to three hours to DA this thing down with a DA and that's just, I don't have that kind of time. I got too many projects going on around here and uh, the, the main thing is heat. Heat is your enemy. Keep the heat out of the metal when you're stripping. Um, if you're, if you're going to do it with a DA or one of those purple wheel type things, move around a lot. Don't stay in one spot too long. Just keep moving around so that you're not warping that metal. A uh, little scenario or a little story I'll tell you here. Um, I did a 73 dart sport for a customer when I was doing body work and hot rods out of my own house. I was actually doing them for customers. I don't do that anymore. Um, and the customer was going to help, which was a mistake. Um, but they took and they said, well, we're going to go ahead and sandblast the back of the hood. And I wasn't thinking anything of it because I thought they meant they were going to sandblast the framework of the hood, which is not a great idea. But okay, well, they sandblasted the whole back of the hood warped the hell out of the hood, caused me hours and hours and hours of dollying and they wouldn't buy another hood for the car. Quite frankly, I just about went out and bought another hood for it myself. Uh, I was so disgusted because of that. Uh, and the reason that metal warped was because of the heat and because you're actually shrinking the metal on the back side with the sandblaster and caused it to suck in. So don't sandblast stuff. That's my point. You will warp it. Keep the heat out of it. You will warp it. Um, you know, as, as I've been doing this for, like I said, 40 years back in the day, I started, uh, you know, pop, <laughs> pop riveting pieces of galvanized on and bondoing back when I was 15 years old, not knowing what I was doing at all. Um, but you learn where you can get away with putting heat into things and where you can't. So edges, as long as you don't have big flat areas next to it. So like up in here on this fender, which you can't see, uh, but there's just that small band. Um, then it's got another crease. That's pretty strong, and it's got the, the crease this way. So I wasn't too worried about heat on top. That didn't warp at all. But if I'm going to weld these down in the side here where that emblem was, which I'm not sure I need to, um, very paranoid about heat there because that will warp the crap out of that. So you really got to watch what you're doing. When I did the top of the fender over on that back corner, um, you know, again, you're, you're right next to a big wide area and I did end up with a little warpage up there. I had to go ahead and dolly that out. I didn't catch it right away. Uh, that's all fixed now. But um, so, you know, 
you've got to really, it wasn't bad, it was you know, minor, but still, you just got to really be careful um, about heat into the metal. I can't emphasize that enough. So I'd rather deal with a little bit of scratch that I know my primer is going to bite into, and especially with these modern fill primes, um, they're going to just fill that up and no problem at all. Uh, it's going to turn out great. But even back in the day when I did my 31 Ford, I stripped the car pretty much this way that I did here. Didn't have those purple wheels back then because that was a long time ago. Uh, but I chemical stripped it, hit, hit it with a grinder with the 80 grit real quick, and then um, went over it with the DA and um, etch primed it and then just lacquer primed it. And I lacquer primed probably 30 coats of lacquer primer on that thing, kept blocking it out, putting it out in the hot sun to shrink. Uh, lacquer primer is one of my favorite products because it's so easy to work with, but because of the environment, they don't, you can still get it, but it's, it's not easy to get. Um, the modern primers don't shrink as much, but you still need to be cautious about that. So um, just, just another little scenario, if you'll put up with my blabbing here on the 88 Dodge truck. I did an experiment years ago with that because I wanted to see, uh, I had to put a driver's door on it. I think it was the third driver's door I had on that truck in the years I've had it. And the door wasn't in great shape, so I just ground it down with 36 grit, um, hit it with the fill prime. Well, we didn't have that uh, polyester primer. I hit it with just regular epoxy primer or uh, urethane primer, uh, let it dry for a couple of hours, blocked it out and painted it. Uh, it still shrunk, and I did it that on purpose because I wanted to see how much shrinkage you could get out of even the chemical reactive um, primers, and, and that was an experiment. It didn't look bad, but it did show sand scratches late, you know, within a couple of weeks after being out in the hot sun. So um, even with these modern products, you're still going to want to let stuff sit. You don't want to rush it too bad unless you can bake it, and even then, I'm more comfortable priming something and letting it sit for... Um, several days or a couple of weeks if possible, depending what else is going on in the shop. Uh, one other tech tip I want to give you, and we may make this a tech tip, but I want to put it in here because it was something I did earlier and I didn't talk about, so hang on. Sometimes I do things uh, without thinking, and I kind of did that here before I, after I covered the cars up, um, I went and wiped this whole thing down with Prepsol to get the last of the strippers off. And it's a common mistake that I see people do, and I want to just talk about it. They'll take their rag, um, their prep saw, they'll put it right over it, and they'll do this and dump it on the rag, go and wipe it down, and then come back and get more and do this. Don't do that. You're backwashing your contaminants from your material on the, you know, what you're wiping down back into this. And then the next thing you wipe down, guess what's going on? If there's any oils or silicones that get off of this onto the rag, it's in your prep saw and your prep saw's crap. And you're going to end up forever chasing fish eyes in product. So the way you do it, take your lid off, of course, hold your rag here, dump it on and then wipe it down. Dump more on and wipe it down. Do not, under any circumstances, put your rag over that can. I, it's just a habit for me after all these years, um, but it's something I see it, a lot of guys that don't have professional experience. Uh, it's a mistake they make, and then they can't figure out why they keep getting fish eyes and everything, even though they've wiped it down with Prepsol 10 times. Well, Prepsol's contaminated, so that's why. Um, so just a little tip there on how to use Prepsol. It's a habit for me with anything that I'm doing do on a rag. Just because of Prepsol, I just don't ever put my rag over the top of it uh, on any product at any time. So wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. It's been a good day out here in my car shop. I'm, I'm happy with what all we got done. This fender is close. Like I said, I got a little bit of dents and stuff to pull. But I think we're going to call it a wrap on this episode. It's going to take me a few hours to put this together and compile it and uh, hopefully get it published today. Maybe not, but uh, we'll get the compressor fixed and go from there. So thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, you don't need to go anywhere else just because the episode's winding down. I looked yesterday and I believe we have 107 videos on the channel right now. So there's plenty of stuff to keep you occupied if you're enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, you'll notice if you go um, from the early stages, which is episode one on the Challenger, uh, which is where we're pulling it out of the field where I bought it from my buddy Dave, um, 
it's changed a lot. When I first started this channel, it was just for family, just to kind of share some of what I was doing on the projects and share some of my skills. And in the last uh, year, I started seeing the potential, uh, about a year ago, I started seeing the potential of what it could be. Um, so that was like September of 19 when I started it. Um, and then when the pandemic started, I started realizing I could do a show, but I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and then probably within the last six months, maybe, uh, kind of got my rhythm here on how to put out what I think is a high quality episode. If there's things that you would like to see on the show, please let me know. If there's things you'd like me to add, uh, you know, part of the channel here is going into detail. We're not a before and after show. We are a show that takes you through the steps. And I get comments all the time from you guys on how much you appreciate seeing the details. Um, and so I really try to share the nitty gritty on how I do this. I'm not saying it's the right way. I'm not saying it's the only way. I'm saying this is the way I do it. I tend to think outside the box. I am lazy. So I try to find shortcuts to make things happen as fast as possible. Um, I'm, a, I'm one of what you call an 80% guy. Uh, my wife teases me all the time whenever I do a project around the house. I get it done about 80%. There's always some little thing that needs to be finished, like there's some trim in the upstairs bathroom that we did 10 years ago that needs to be finished. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I function is I think big picture um, as a CEO of a company that I own, I think 30,000 foot view on everything. So um, I can do the detail work on the cars. Sure, I can and I will, but I tend to try to save as much time as possible to accomplish as much work as possible, as fast as possible. Uh, that's why we can do 10 cars in the shop right now that we have here and uh, keep fluttering between projects and keep moving forward. So um, we'll be doing another one on this. Uh, I want to get back on that Challenger so bad and get that frame rail put in, but uh, I won't be crawling around under that car unless my wife is home and she works a lot. So it'll be a Saturday project at some point. Also the Oakland, there's going to be another episode coming on that soon. I've been working on the oil pan screens, um, figuring out what I need to order to get that oil pan screens fixed. We'll show you what that means. Uh, I've got to adjust the valves yet. So we'll get Dad back out here maybe and uh, teach him how to adjust valves on a 26 Oakland. So you can look forward to that, Dad, if you're watching this. Um, so that hopefully will be happening here in the next week or so as well. Uh, we're, we're just about ready to put the head back on, get the timing chain back on, but we got to get that oil pan um, fixed so we can get it back on the bottom of that engine. Anyway, enough yakking. Thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Every one of you. There's almost 300 of you here now. Uh, the channel has been just growing like crazy since before Christmas. Um, I, I'm just thrilled. Um, I love your feedback. I love your encouragement. I, I like hearing what you're enjoying. So keep, please keep dropping those comments down there. Um, like I said, we're a unique channel. We don't always do things the way other people want, but this is the way I do it, and I appreciate knowing you guys are learning something, and it's taking some of the intimidation out of doing these projects. So, all right, that's going to do it for today. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do hit the bell for notifications. Uh, we're on Instagram and Facebook. I'm constantly posting updates there multiple times a day, uh, forward slash my cause shop over there. And uh, once again, drop comments down here, like the channel, uh, like the videos also. Um, I appreciate every single one of you, and I do read every single comment that we have on the channel. Oh, you didn't think I forgot, did you? <laughs> Rock on.